I'm not going to go into a long introduction, but I want to say that Bill Hines is a 28-year veteran uh, with the Fire Department of New York City and uh, been in some of the most uh, treacherous areas, uh, heavily involved uh, in 9-11, uh, and he's going to share uh, from his heart today. He's going to share from experience, a true first responder. So would you please welcome Captain Bill Hines today. I'd like to thank Pastor Drost, your family, and your staff, especially Mr. and Mrs. Ron and Linda Richards, for inviting me to be part of this 9-11 memorial service. I also want to thank your community for coming out to support the brave and dedicated members of our armed services and emergency services who sit in front of us today. It is my privilege and honor to be speaking to you today. It is a special privilege to be speaking to those who have served our country and those who have served your community through your fire, EMS, and police departments. As Pastor Dros has introduced me, my name is Bill Hines. Uh, he demoted me, and I am a retired chief of the New York City Fire Department. All right. Okay. Just don't mess with my paycheck. Okay. okay. My career spanned 28 years where I worked in just about every conceivable area of New York City, from its unassuming residential and light commercial outer boroughs to the bright lights of Manhattan, where I worked my last 10 years, the Emerald City. And yes, the rumors are true. Okay? It really is a city that never sleeps. September 11th is a day that we need to keep near and dear to our hearts. It is a day that we must not forget. Just as we must not forget Pearl Harbor, or D-Day, or other significant days that shaped our country, our values, our liberty. We look back on that day in 2001 and remember the sacrifices made and how we were able to rally and come back even stronger than before. As a department, we lost 343 firefighters. Personally, I lost 21 firefighters in my battalion five firefighters in my firehouse, and approximately 40 good friends of mine. They were of all ranks that I grew up with on the job. Some of them broke me in when I was just a 21-year-old wise guy kid who thought he knew everything. We do not forget the 2,753 who also lost their lives that dreadful day in New York, the 184 lost at the Pentagon, and the 40 killed when the plane went down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It should be noted that many of those civilians who died that day died while performing heroic tasks. This is a part of the 9-11 story that does not get the attention it deserves. We will always remember the chant, let's roll. We do not forget those who have given their service, whether as a responder, as a volunteer, who have succumbed to the maladies which they incurred from the events and exposure to the 9-11 incident sites. We do not forget those brave men and women of our military who have answered the call of duty to serve and protect our country and who have given the supreme sacrifice. Today, in addition to remembering the day, we honor these people. You probably heard this before, but it holds true for many of us who remember that September day. Every day that there is a clear blue sky just as today, I think of the events of that day. It took me quite some time to be able to talk about the events of 9-11. We as first responders, and I'm sure those in the armed services, we keep our emotions pretty close to the vest. We may confide in each other about a situation, but it's funny how we keep many of those feelings from others, especially our loved ones. I'm not sure why we do this, but it, it just is the way it is. Well, here it is, 16 years later, and I can tell you that I'm still angry. Okay. Too many good, caring, unselfish people lost their lives that day. And some of those unselfish people were also great firefighters. 
There were firefighters who were up and coming, forward thinkers, who would have made a great impact on the department and their communities. Well, as time went on, I came to hear some of the civilian victim stories and came to realize that there, too, were too many beautiful lives lost. Well, I pause here to acknowledge the love and support that we received as a department from so many outside individuals and organizations. It was an immense effort, and it was an immense comfort. Personally, I am very thankful for my family, friends, and neighbors who were a huge support to me, especially to my beautiful wife, Kate, and my two children, Allison and Tim. But as I reflect on that day, I realize that if this happened on September 10th, or September 12th, or any other day, we as responders would have answered the call. Yes, we now respond differently to certain situations, but if an incident of this magnitude occurred tomorrow, I have no doubt that responders and communities would do what was called upon to protect life. We are presently heartened by the response of both responders and civilians alike as we watch those helping their fellow man during the devastating effects of Hurricane Harvey in Texas and Louisiana, and now, as we speak, in Florida. I was one of the fortunate souls the day of 11, uh, September 11th. I was scheduled to work that tour, but due to my wedding anniversary being on September 10th, yes, today, yeah, one of the other chiefs swapped tours with me and worked uh, so I could be with my wife and we could celebrate. Well, he didn't make it back. As like some of us, I was home finishing my third cup of coffee when I heard on the news that a plane may have accidentally hit number one World Trade Center. I viewed the impact impression left on the tower on the local news, dropped my coffee, and sped into work. On the way down, the reporter on the radio blurted out that a second plane just hit Tower 2. I could see the smoke billowing from the towers. Just as I got into Manhattan, Tower 2 collapsed. Just as I got to my firehouse, Tower 1 collapsed. We commandeered a bus and made it down to the west side of Manhattan to as close as we could get. The smoke plume was lifting about 100 feet off the ground and moving east. Well, we had to make our way, our way around the financial center, which was between the debris field and the Hudson River. I made it around to the southwest corner of the center and saw the debris field for the first time. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. No towers, no 22-story Marriott Hotel. The debris was piled up approximately three stories against the financial center, which was across the street from where the towers and hotel once were, approximately 200 feet. I stood there for about 10 seconds, and it felt more like 10 minutes. It felt like someone just hit me in the head with a hammer. Please know, at the time, I had 20 years on the job and thought I had seen enough bad situations, but this was unprecedented. I took a deep breath and went to work. Yes, I know. Where do you start? There were only a few working radios at first, and thankfully, we were able to start some organization. We were able to initially grid out the 16-acre debris field into four sectors. I was coordinating operations in the West Command near the Marriott Hotel and parts of Tower One. Well, the next several days were exhausting, and I still don't fully recall all of the time. But what I do remember is this. I remember members of the FDNY, NYPD, and EMS responding into the site, those both on duty and off. The dedication of our responders is second to none. Well, then I remember iron workers, construction workers, electricians, and soon after, responders from neighboring towns and cities showing up to help. Each of the designated sectors was short of help, so we initially put them all to work. I look back, and to this day, I'll be the first to say that we couldn't have done the things we did, the searches, the debris clearing, the removals, without these dedicated, unselfish people. Well, then came another wave of help, the volunteers. Different organizations, you know, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, the CERT teams, the volunteer organizations activated in disasters, they came in by the droves. And as they did, 
in D.C. and Shanksville also. Well, they fed us, they clothed us, they mended us, they gave us morale and spiritual support. They were a godsend. Again, I found myself saying that we couldn't have done this without them. Well, in the days and months that followed, I found that the volunteers from around the country kept coming. They were relentless in ensuring that all support services were in place. As for the responders, they kept coming too. We actually used some of the out-of-town responders to cover our firehouses at one point during the first few days until we were able to cover them with our own personnel. Well, from out of the ashes rises the phoenix. Why do I say this? Well, in the months and years that followed 9-11, there were poignant stories of people moved to get involved and make a difference. A restaurant owner who opened his doors to feed responders and anyone else that needed a meal, who now donates meals to our New York City Meals on Wheels program. There's a woman who wanted to comfort victims' families by making quilts. Over a thousand quilts were made. The story of a Pennsylvania man who walked from Shanksville to DC to New York City and raised money for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Health professionals who organized volunteer response teams neighborhoods who organize volunteer food and clothes drives. You know, I hear these stories, and this is what makes me proud and gives me some comfort. There's one story in particular that touched my very soul to the core. We had a memorial service to mark the one-year anniversary of 9-11 at Madison Square Garden, and responders throughout the country and from all over the world came in for the service. It was a miserable day on all accounts. The weather was awful, the forecast was for heavy rain throughout the day. Well, Madison Square Garden only holds approximately 23,000 people. Well, FDN responders and their families took up all of the seats. There was no room for most of the responders who came from miles to show support. Well, at one point, the big jumbotron screen high above our heads showed the scene that had formed outside the garden. There, in the pouring rain, were thousands of responders, four, five, six deep, circling the garden, standing at attention during the service. It was a sight that I'll never forget. After the ceremony, we went back to my firehouse to prepare to bring uh, families of the falling firefighters out to a luncheon. While getting ready, a knock came at the firehouse door. The house watchman, and this is a firefighter who's assigned to manage who comes into the firehouse. He answered the door. Well, there were three firefighters from the Hereford Worcester Fire Brigade in England. They handed the house watchman a wet envelope and said that they wanted to make a contribution to our Widows and Children's Fund. Well, the house watchman took the envelope, said thank you, and the three firefighters started to walk down the block. Well, the house watchman called me down and told me what had transpired. Well, I opened up the envelope and I was stunned. The envelope held a check for $1.2 million. Okay. Well, I told the Haas watchman to move out and track those guys down. Well, we brought them in, gave them dry clothes, and brought them to lunch with us. They told me that they weren't sure who to give the money to, so they just thought to stop by the nearest firehouse. Well, I'm glad they did. Okay. <laughs> they told the story of how they raised the money through boot drives. Firefighters, that's firefighters standing in intersections, filling their boots with collected donations for their fellow responders across the pond. Well, I called our FD headquarters and we organized a more formal ceremony for them for the donation. So today, I wanna make a plea to all of you. Okay? Let us never forget the day we recollect today. Never forget the heroes, both the ones in uniform and civilian who performed heroic deeds that day. Never forget the innocent lives that were taken that day. And never forget the strength and commitment we all experienced in rebuilding to an even stronger place. To our military personnel, past and present, and our first responders who sit in front of me. First, I again say thank you for your dedication and service to us. Vets, you are our heroes. 
You heard the calling of our nation, and you answered it with unconditional bravery. Responders, you give up your time away from your loved ones, and you risk your personal safety to keep your community from harm and answer the call. We all sleep more soundly at night knowing this. We sincerely appreciate your dedication and commitment. To both of you, responders and vets, my favor is this. You are the mentors, the teachers, the ones who have done it. Please know that your knowledge and experiences are valuable tools in shaping the next generation of military and responder personnel. Please pass this knowledge on. Be passionate about it. Be involved. The inexperienced need your guidance. To the community members, important things don't get done without your involvement. From the simple things as knocking on a door to check on a neighbor, to organizing a clothing drive, to volunteering to become a first responder. Some of these things take a little effort, others take a commitment. But they all have one thing in common. They are the things that make a difference on a larger scale. Some of you are already involved in one way or another. Please pass on that sense of giving. It is up to all of us to remember what the underlying message is as we remember 9-11 on this day. That message is, we help anyone who is in need, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, gender, or economic status. It only matters that someone needs help. It is a calling that some hear, and I wish that all may hear. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down their life for another. Thank you again for this opportunity and privilege. Stay safe.